last talk um, for both the Cambridge Society for Economic Pluralism as well as the Rural Poor Society. Now, to end this term, and in fact, the year of events, we have a fantastic event on has British politics been replaced by economics? And for this talk, we have two fantastic speakers, Lord Eatwell and Lord Wilson of Finton. So, Lord Eatwell is a current president of Queen's. He's been there now 19 years. Um, he's the Labour spokesperson for the Treasury and Economic Affairs in the House of Lords, as well as being a professor of financial policy at the University of Cambridge. Both speakers actually give a degree, give, sorry, give a speech in and a few lectures in the first year economics degree, so we're very well acquainted with that degree as well as the subject. Secondly, we have Lord Wilson of Dinton, who was a previous master at Emma Emanuel College. He is the current head, he was the head of the economic secretariat of the cabinet office under Margaret Thatcher and is currently life peer with the House of Lords. So this is as quite a broad reaching big question um, as you'd expect from most of CSEP and TWS events. But First, we'll have Lord Ewell to introduce the topic and present his. No, 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 if you're looking ahead at economics and politics and trying to work out their relationship, uh, you, it's worth asking yourself uh, if there's anything you can learn from history. So I thought I would begin, unusually, I don't normally do this, with just reading you a quotation which reads as follows. Very few of us realise the intensely unusual, unstable, complicated, unreliable, temporary nature of the organization, economic organization, by which Western Europe has lived for the last half century. We assume some of the most peculiar and temporary of our advantages to be natural, permanent, uh, and dependable, and we make our plans accordingly. On this sandy and false foundation, we scheme for social improvement and we dress our political platforms. We pursue our animosities and our ambitions, and we feel ourselves with enough margin in hand to foster, not damp down, civil conflict in the European family. Now, that was uh, written in a famous book uh, by uh, the economic, the Treasury's observer at the Paris Peace Conference a hundred years ago, uh, John Maynard Keynes, uh, who, in a you know, I think a marvellous book, if you haven't read it, if you're an economist, do read it. It's called The Economic Consequences of the Peace. And it's a very readable book. It's got a marvellous description of the uh, participants of the Paris Peace Conference when um, the leaders of most world governments, heads of state, came to live in Paris for six months to deal with, to decide how the world should be divided up and run. Uh, including the League of Nations. And they, most of the problems we've dealt with since the First World War have their roots at the Paris Peace Conference, including Iraq. Uh, but the interesting thing about the passage for today is the implication uh, that we take economic prosperity for granted. We, it is human nature to assume that the stability and prosperity which we enjoy are the natural order of things and we assemble around ourselves a sense of coziness and security, which isn't something which actually we can take for granted. Uh, I mean, we have had 70 years of peace and prosperity in the United Kingdom, uh, which, we have, which is almost unprecedented in history and has been hugely beneficial. But it's been, to some extent, the chance result of uh, a favourable world circumstances, not least in the last... 20 years, uh, the growth in, of, of the eco Chinese economy. Uh, and my thesis to you is that uh, all, it's not a case of economics uh, replacing um, e politics, but that economics is the underlying foundation uh, uh, which helps shape the way that political issues are developed. I also uh, think that the um, uh, reference to feeling that we've got enough margin in hand to be able to uh, 
embarked on civil conflict in Europe, is relevant at a time when we are having a referendum on Europe. If you think about the, um, the, the way in which it's dividing the Tory party and the Labour party uh, from top to bottom, and also causing huge uh, disruption at a time when Europe should be concentrating on the Eurozone and migration, uh, it is clear that we do feel sufficiently confident in our own economic stability to be able to launch that kind of debate with the threats that it, 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 it involves. Um, if you look at, uh, at uh, if you take my basic point, which is that we all like to think of the way the world as it is now, as a kind of settled state, uh, which we can take for granted, it has one result, which is that when we do forecasting, when we look ahead, uh, we all tend to assume that the future is a straight line extrapolation of where we are at the moment. And businesses everywhere tend to do business forecasts, and they take the present circumstances and they do they extend it forward. And the Chancellor does governments do the same. The Chancellor next week, when he has the um, forecast from the ABR, will be assuming the stability, the basic stability of our economy. Uh, and the same is true of the world political order. But it's not it's actually not what the evidence tells us. When I was in the Cabinet Office in 1972, I um, was asked to coordinate a paper forecasting what the world would be like in 25 years' time, namely 1997. And what, although I don't wish to sound be modest, I can tell you the paper was, well, had a modest success of its own and was actually sent forward to the Prime Minister and everyone said what an interesting piece of work it was. And when I got to be as Cabinet Secretary in 1997, I asked to see the piece of paper again, to see how the world had turned out compared to what we had forecast 25 years before. And I have to tell you that the piece of paper was dreadful. It got absolutely everything wrong. It was so much so that I like to think it's been lost somewhere in the archives of Kew. Because um, what we had done is take the world as it was in 72 and assume that in 1997 it would be the same world, only a, you know 4% growth per annum uh, and much the same otherwise, uh, just a bit more so. And of course the reality was it was completely different. It, it took absolutely, it assumed that computers, for instance, would remain large machines in refrigerated rooms looked after by men in white coats. Uh, it had no idea of the microchip. The concept of the internet or of emails or of mobile phones were absolutely nowhere there. It assumed in the political level that the Soviet Union would continue to be a single state, that the Berlin Wall would continue and that the Cold War would continue. It assumed that China would continue to be stuck in the Cultural Revolution. Uh, and the idea that it could be an engine for growth, a world economic growth, uh, was simply not conceivable at that time. The list, I could go on endlessly, the list of things which it got wrong was much greater than I don't think it got anything right. And the same is going to be true for the next 25 years. The thing which you can take for granted in your adult lives will be whatever else happens, the world is not going to be a straightforward extrapolation of the world in 2016 through to 2040, uh, whatever it is, I can't do the arithmetic, uh, to the 2040s. It, the world is going to change in all sorts of ways which you cannot conceive of. Um, and the, the, uh, and the, there's no difficulty in, in the world as it is at the moment in seeing the ways in which E the econ economics, the basic e fundamental economics of the world, could change which, and lead to major political problems. Uh, just taking the immediate short term, if we remain in Europe or if we leave Europe, we'll have fundamental e e implications for our economy. Um, you could argue, you, I don't know which side, you'll all be on different sides. So I guess, actually, most of you are on the Remain side, but I may be wrong about that. But if we remain in Europe, it is our future will be, in some ways, different from if we leave Europe. And that, again, <coughs> will condition uh, the, 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 the world we're in. In terms of political, the politics of it, uh, I suspect that the, it, it, the, 
it's more the leaving Europe will, will have more political significance in some ways than economic significance. I, I talked once to someone who did the negotiations, the original negotiations in 1962, to, when we first applied to join the common market. And the official assessment then was that in economic terms, it would not in the end be that big a difference. It would give us a bigger market and it would alter the balance of our food supplies and so on. But the real arguments were about our position in the world and our political strength. Uh, as part of a larger community rather than trying to be on our own and at that time we were shedding empire uh, and being fairly isolated uh, as it were from all the major power blocks of the world. But if again uh, another major issue around the moment, major uncertainty, is China. Uh, we don't, any of us really know uh, what um, China's growth is at the moment. The indications are certainly that it's lower than the 7% they forecast I think it's quite possible myself, but uh, I bow to economists, that the rate of growth could be significantly lower than 7%. They are attempting a major shift uh, towards a consumer economy, huge ambition. Uh, I think China is the most extraordinary economic exper and political experiment uh, possibly that the world's ever known, on, at least on a scale unknown. Uh, and tr attempting to run a market economy and a consumer economy with a centralised communist government is quite an ambitious uh, challenge. Uh, and the rest of us will have to live with the consequences. But those consequences will be very important for our economics and thus, in my argument, for the politics too. Um, Europe itself is, I think, a source of its, uh, uh, uncertainty. Uh, you can argue that Europe has attempted to go too far too fast that the Eurozone was a brave project, uh, but that um, it was, they failed to look at the very obvious, at least it's obvious to the rest of us who, who weren't in it, the very obvious importance of having political and fiscal integration if you're going to have a, a, a common currency. Uh, but the, the, the uncertainties around Europe, with the mass migration which is assaulting it at the moment, uh, and the insecurity in the Middle East, are, I think, potentially uh, destructive could be, on, depending on what scenario you go on, uh, in a way which could be very uh, have big implications for both for the economics and the politics of the country. And indeed, you could say that the threat of extreme governments of left and right at the moment across the Western world is is the res direct result of huge political upheavals in 2008. In, in America, the extraordinary rise and rise of Donald Trump and to some extent of Bernie Sanders, uh, I think are an expression of deep anger uh, of ordinary people in America with the political elite. You can see the, uh, Jeremy Corbyn's success in this country, which is quite extraordinary in the Labour Party, as being in some sense a deep reflection of uh, a dissatisfaction which we saw to some degree in the 70s, but I mean, no, Tony Benn never got as far as Jeremy Corbyn has now got. Uh, and when you look around Europe, either in France, Marie Le Pen, or in Germany, where Angela Merkel's being challenged, or any country, actually, uh, the, 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 the political significance of economic upheaval uh, are, are pretty evident. And where that will lead, I don't know, but if you go back to Maynard Keynes, his analysis of the consequences of the, of the peace treaty and the economic consequences of it uh, were absolutely spot on. His analysis of the problems of debt that had accumulated in Europe and had been consolidated in the, uh, in the, uh, in the, uh, peace, the Paris Peace Conference, uh, he's, he analysed that they were unstable and the instability led to Hitler and to the Second World War. So there's, there's a sense in which um, we are at the moment living through a period where economic instability and we undoubtedly have, say, an asset bubble in, in this country, we have, and the volume the level of debt is, is enormous. Um, the government debt and the level of the state of our balance of payments and our trade balances, and our, uh, 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 again, are huge and depend on retaining confidence of overseas investors and uh, overseas markets. Uh, and if we lost that confidence, the consequences for the UK economy and thus for UK politics could be very serious. You have Russia, uh, another source of uncertainty and instability, uh, which is uh, potentially 
uh, very serious, but uh, with, a, with Putin exploiting uh, divisions in, uh, in, in the uh, European alliance and weakness in the American presidency. Uh, you have commodities, oil markets, which at the moment are very low, but I was put in charge of energy policy in October uh, 1973, when the, uh, the weekend, I took up the job the week after the weekend when the Arab-Israeli war broke out and the oil price quadrupled within a matter of weeks. Uh, so never assume that oil prices are going to remain low for a very long time. If Saudi Arabia, say, the monarchy were to fall, that would be an earthquake of enormous proportions, not only economically but politically in the Middle East, and would have huge and far-reaching consequences. So um, I think that the political, I think the economic uncertainties are great. I think the political uncertainties are great. Uh, of the American presidential election I've talked about. In this country, I could not be, I shall leave it to the Labour Party, ex front spokesman for the Labour Party, to say what's going to happen, but I would not be surprised if we were to find that the Tory party split from top to bottom, and in some sense may call common cause with the Blairite wing of the Labour Party, and conceivably one or two Liberal Democrats, and we ended up with some sort of centralist alliance, not a not a formed party, which would, could shape, transform the shape of, of British politics for some time. Um, not all ch unforeseen changes are bad. Uh, I'm about to finish. But not unfor all unforeseen changes are bad. Uh, I conceive that we could actually muddle through this period of uncertainty. Uh, it's quite possible that ISIS will be defeated. It's possible that some sort of peace in Syria will be botched up and that uh, people who are genuine refugees will be able to go home. It's possible that China will manage the transition from, uh, from uh, its present uh, uncertainty to uh, being a consumer economy and become an engine with huge scope for growth again. It's possible that um, uh, research and technology in the UK, where Cambridge is, is absolutely central, will turn out to be a huge a source of wealth and industrial uh, entre uh, entrepreneurship and, uh, uh, and social change uh, and the world could find this being an awkward moment and we grow out of it. All I can tell you is that uh, economics and politics, which I regard as both as branches of the social sciences, uh, just to be provocative for a moment, um, both economics and politics will continue to have be tightly interwoven because both of them are the dimensions of uh, social activity and both it depend are heavily influenced by what happens in the other. So that's my analysis. And the answer to the question is, has politics been replaced by economics? Is no, they are interdependent. Thank you very much indeed. All uh, right. Thank you, Richard. And uh, I agree with just about everything that uh, Richard Wilson has said. Um, it just gives me the opportunity, so it's always nice to be able to tell a story at the beginning of giving a talk. Um, he mentioned uh, Keynes' Economic Consequences of the Peace, which I also regard as a major important work. Um, it, it's, uh, it also embodied, one of the reasons it's such a good read, is it embodies with it pen portraits of key figures, including uh, President Wilson and uh, Lloyd George, the British Prime Minister, who is dis described as a cloven-hoofed goat from the Welsh marches, coming out of the mist in Wales, come, bringing all this sort of peculiar magic and mystery. Uh, anybody here who's Welsh, don't be offended, but that's how Keynes described Lloyd George. Now, the, the, uh, the major historian of that conference and of the debates of, around the First World War and its consequences uh, is a, a woman called Barbara Macmillan, who is the warden of St. Anthony's College, Oxford. And Margaret is a tall, elegant Canadian, uh, very much a Canadian. You can see her on a sort of southern Ontario farm. And I sat next to her once at a dinner, and I said, we started talking about the First World War, and I said, how wonderful Keynes's book was. She said, no, it's absolutely dreadful. It's appalling. And I was really taken aback by this, because she's the real expert on, 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 on the era. And I said, but no, so sorry. And then a wonderful pen portrait. She said, no, they're disgusting. I then discovered that Lloyd George was her grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, so there was a sort of personal element in this. And just one other comment on uh, Richard's paper, which he wrote, uh, which 25 years later he got everything wrong. 
Um, there's a famous comment by uh, J.K. Galbraith that the role of economic forecasting is to give astrology a good name. <laughs> um, so uh, one shouldn't feel too embarrassed about that. Um, what I want to talk about uh, is I agree entirely with Richard that uh, economics and politics are intertwined, but I do think that the failure of the governments in the West really to respond effectively to the financial crisis of 2007-2008 uh, and the consequence in terms of unemployment or indeed very low wages um, very low wages in the United States where median wages have real wages, median real wages have not increased for about 25 years and indeed have fallen for the last five years. Um, in the UK we've had this increase in employment but this is predominantly self-employment and of the self-employed two-thirds earn below the minimum wage. Uh, so that if actually they could get a job at the minimum wage they'd be better off um, but they are self-employed. And so a whole series of people are feeling the real costs of the financial crisis. And there doesn't seem to be any evidence that the political authorities know what to do and can get a real grip uh, of what has happened. If you look at the recovery rates uh, from the crisis, the United States has had the best recovery, but its recovery is still slower than its recovery from the Great Depression. And it is the slowest recovery uh, from any modern recession. And this is true of everywhere else as well. The UK is, has the slowest recovery uh, from any recession that the UK has suffered uh, in the 20th century, and certainly recessions since the war. So there is this feeling of economic failure, and part of the anger that we see in extremist populist politicians, sometimes on the left, sometimes on the right, appearing all over Europe, uh, the Trump phenomenon in the United States, is, I think, driven by this feeling of economic failure, of the feeling that the, the elites, if you like, uh, the pol politics, business as usual classes, don't know what to do and don't really have a grip uh, on economic policy. And this merges into uh, the deterioration of services, uh, public services, and uh, personal economic problems, either in terms of wages or jobs or whatever it might be. Um, now the question is, why not? Um, I, many of the people here are probably reading economics, or perhaps you're reading politics or international relations. Um, so why is it that the uh, political elite, having had quite moderate success uh, since the Second World War, uh, with some major hiccups of course, but generally we've seen an increase in living standards uh, throughout the Western world, why is it that in Europe uh, we see GDP falling, living standards falling? Uh, in the UK and the US we have this very slow uh, recovery, which is, as I said just now, is inferior to that of previous recessions. So what's the problem? And I'm going to identify three issues uh, which are uh, relevant. First of all, I'm going to argue there are no levers to pull. Uh, in other words, I'm going to argue that the politicians uh, implement policies, but nothing happens. And to, to discuss, I'm going to try to argue why nothing happens. Um, secondly, the relationship between policy and evidence, always a rather tenuous relationship, because people are not in politics to look at evidence, they're looking in politics to pursue political objectives, and they want the evidence to fit their political objectives. But the lack of uh, relationship between policy and evidence is to us in a university particularly shocking, uh, but is a characteristic, I think, of policy making today. And then there's a third element, uh, which really does come home for us in the universities, uh, which is that there is no logically coherent, generally accepted framework of macroeconomics. Macroeconomics was blown up, and it basically the bits have not been put together. There are people who pretend that they have economic models, but nobody really believes in them. Me, and nobody is sure uh, exactly what to do. So let's first of all deal with the, my first point, that there are no levers to pull. Now, uh, when I came to this university as an undergraduate uh, in the 1960s, let me say, um, we were taught uh, that there were particular economic models in terms of fiscal and monetary policy, uh, that these models would manage uh, full employment, 
that any level of unemployment above 3% unemployed was, would be a disaster, and any government associated with that would be thrown out of office instantly. And that generally, government, it was the government's responsibility to manage the macro framework. And indeed, they did. And not only did they do it, but there was a general uh, uh, um, acceptance. There, there was a common view of how this management should take place. Uh, the, the Conservative Party would manage in one particular direction, given their political goals. The Labour Party would manage in a slightly different direction. But uh, broadly, uh, they would operate according to the same levers to pull and buttons to push. Um, now, in fact, this, this policy structure even had a name. It was called Butskalism after R.A. Butler, the conservative politician, and Hugh Gateskill, the labor politician. He said butskalism was the combination of the, the common view that people had. Now, one interesting issue is, okay, why, could, why did they have such control? And why am I arguing that they don't have the levers to pull or the buttons to push now? And the answer is that the, the economies of the Western world were relatively financially autonomous. There were fairly strict capital controls preventing flows of capital in and out of the major economies, including the United States, which in the 1960s had something called the interest equalization tax, which meant that if you invested outside the United States, you got a bigger return than you get inside the United States. Uncle Sam taxed away the difference. Those of you who've uh, studied economic history will recognize this was exactly the same as the Corn Laws. Um, Corn laws preventing the importation of corn, and the interest equalization tax uh, prevented the export of capital from the United States. And so financially, the units were relatively autonomous. So that if you pursued a particular policy, the impact on financial markets within your economy were relatively confined to your economy. And you could uh, analyze these, you could model them, and you could assess what the consequence would be of pulling a particular lever. You had some idea of what would then happen. Now this world uh, ended on the 15th of August 1971. Because it was on the 15th of August 1971 that President Richard Nixon closed the gold window. And the, the Bretton Woods system, which had characterized the financial stability regime in the Western world uh, after the Second World War, uh, was at an end. And a key aspect that uh, Nixon destroyed by his decision was this. Up until 1971, Western countries essentially had fixed exchange rates. They were also fixed to gold in the structure of the IMF's treaty, but that doesn't matter very much, although uh, it had some consequences. And what fixed exchange rates meant was that the public sector carried foreign exchange risk. If you were uh, a British uh, manufacturer selling goods to the United States, you knew exactly what, how many dollars you would get for your pound. Because the dollar-pound exchange rate didn't change at all from 1948 to 1966. It was exactly the same all the time. The public sector guaranteed what it was. Now, as a consequence of Nixon closing the gold window, which actually meant the currencies started floating against each other after 1971. There was some attempt to put back fixed exchange rates between 71 and 73, but then that collapsed, and exchange rates began to fluctuate. That meant that foreign exchange risk was privatized. Because now, if you were a British manufacturer selling into the United States, you didn't know how many dollars you'd get. You had a risk, a real risk now. And to cover your risk, you needed access to financial markets, but there were capital controls. <coughs> So the only way that you could have fluctuating exchange rates, as it was now the case, uh, and allow trade to flourish, was to abolish capital controls. Because then uh, financial institutions could provide hedging, they could provide forward currency, they could provide the financial infrastructure, which would allow, in this new risky environment, trade to take place. But it had another consequence, this. The other consequence was the explosion of uh, international finance. So for example, be, in early 1971, the ratio of foreign exchange transactions to trade and long-term investment was 2 to 1. 
So the actual value of transactions relative to the value of trade was 2 to 1. It's now 80 to 1. So the number of foreign exchange transactions supporting the export of one Mercedes from Germany to the United States is 80 times bigger than the value of the Mercedes. And a lot of that is hedging, and those hedging instruments are then resold and repackaged and so on uh, in the overall structure of modern financial markets. On top of that, there was an explosion in the international bond market. So in the US, uh, uh, before 1970, um, US bonds, uh, overseas trade in US bonds was worth about 3% of US GDP. Um, now it's about 200% of US GDP, the value of the trade in bonds. Uh, but anything Americans can do, we can do better. Um, the overseas trade in bonds for the UK in 1970 was zero because it would have been illegal under the capital control regime. Today it's about 1,000% of UK GDP, the trade in bonds. Now one, one uh, effect of that is that if you pursue policies that the bond market thinks is unreasonable, the international bond market, then there will be immediate reactions in your bond market on your interest rates and your ability to fund your national debt or whatever. You are now a subject of the international financial markets. And governments have much less control. And this isn't just the UK. Um, the Clinton administration attempted a fiscal expansion in the early years of uh, President Clinton's presidency. And the consequence was a run on the US bond market, which forced interest rates up in the United States and killed the policy. And James Carvel, who was uh, President Clinton's uh, political advisor, uh, wrote this in response. And I wish I could do the New Orleans accent, but I can't. But what uh, James Carvel said was, I used to think that if they're reincarnation, I wanted to come back as the president or the pope or as a 400 baseball hitter. 400 is very good. But now I'd like to come back as the bond market. You can intimidate everybody. And that is what you can do. So what we see, what we've seen, for example, in Greece, what we've seen in uh, the UK, what we've seen in all European countries, is a fear of the international bond market and of disturbing the, fin the international financial stability. And in those in those circumstances, you no longer have control of your own financial structure. You don't, can't accurately model what would happen if you pull it a bit particular lever. So that's the first thing. Um, governments have lost the degree of control they have over economies. The second thing is that increasingly one feels that uh, evidence doesn't matter very much for policy. Now, for those of you who do development economics, You'll know that one of the most important books of the last few years has been by um, ah Ahajit Banerjee and uh, Esther Duflo, both of MIT, and they wrote this book called Poor Economics. And their basic statement is about development economics, the practice of development policy, as well as the accompanying debates, seems to be premised on the impossibility of relying on evidence. Verifiable evidence is a chimera. At best, a distant fantasy, at worst, a distraction. <clears throat> we have to get on with the work whilst you indulge yourselves in the fantasy of the pursuit of evidence is what hard-headed policymakers and their even harder-headed advisors tell us. But it isn't only in the area of development. For example, uh, one of the issues that one, uh, that's in policy which has been enormously important in the last few years and discussed extensively is the role of uh, genetically modified crops. Um, now just two years ago the chief and scientific advisor to the president of the European Commission, Professor Anne Glover, who's from the uh, University of Aberdeen uh, and a very distinguished biological scientist, wrote a policy paper on GM crops and GM testing. Uh, as a result she was fired and the post of chief scientific advisor abolished, just so that awkward evidence wouldn't appear. Um, but then it also comes this problem of what we do with respect to evidence. <coughs> we also see in British politics, there's a, there was a, a nice discussion at a parliamentary committee 
um, about the Welfare, Welfare Reform Act of 2012. And uh, the minister was one Esther McVeigh. And uh, she, she uh, was uh, involved in cutting job seekers' allowance, which is the amount of time that you are supported by benefits whilst looking for a job when you're unemployed. And minimum job seekers' allowance went from two weeks to four weeks, and the maximum went from uh, six months to three years. In other words, you've got four weeks before you get anything, and uh, you have to wait uh, for a much longer time. Uh, you, sorry, it's a much shorter time. Maximum went from three years to six months. You can only have it for a much shorter time. And so at the parliamentary committee, she was asked whether this cut in job seekers' allowance would be effective, and she said... Um, benefit sanctions are effective, she said. Uh, but, it was asked, are there any reasonable grounds that could be shared with the committee to think this policy will be effective? It soon became evident that there were not. I take it from your failure to answer the question that you didn't do any research, said the chairman of the committee. Ms. McVeigh did not reply. <laughs> <coughs> so, and then the Joseph Browntree Foundation, which looks at a lot of these things, has recently published a study on evidence in policy making and has said, in countries where policy objectives are most closely connected to taxpayer buy-in, irrespective of empirical evidence, one would argue that even the best specified impact results are of little or even secondary importance to the political impetus for the reform. In other words, governments and electorates don't care much about evidence. They just care about the story. And then the third element <coughs> of my uh, issue about eco failure to make economic policy is the lack of coherent uh, economic policy, uh, co coherent eco macroeconomics. Now, there are two basic approaches to macroeconomics. There's one approach which says the economy has an inherent tendency to adjust towards equilibrium. <coughs> Excuse me, an equilibrium would include um, to adjust to a, a, a level of full employment, or for economists, a natural rate of unemployment. And this tendency can be interrupted by uncertainty, by mistakes, uh, by shocks. But ultimately, it will reassert itself. And so, for example, the whole theory of, uh, of austerity is that whilst you change government spending, eventually the private sector will respond and the economy will go back towards equilibrium. The alternative view is that there is no such tendency. And Keynes, in the general theory, argued that there was no such tendency. It didn't exist. You had a thing called an underemployment equilibrium. You could sit at low levels of activity and nothing would happen. Now, what is the ultimate theory underpinning the proposition that economies basically gravitate back towards full employment? You know, if you've got unemployment, wages are too high and sticky, or uncertainty has prevented people uh, taking appropriate decisions. In other words, that uh, unemployment or the failure of the economy to respond and to move back towards an equilibrium is due to mistakes and shocks and jerks, but eventually it will assert itself. Well, the underlying uh, theory is the arrow de Bro notion of general equilibrium. That is, that a general equilibrium set of prices exist, which clear markets. And uh, that uh, is the basis. Now, the problem for those pe people who argue that there is a tendency towards uh, equilibrium is that whilst Arrow and De Bruyne argued that there exists a set of prices associated with full employment and other e characteristics of equilibrium, De Bruyne himself has argued that there is no way of proving there's a tendency towards it. In fact, in what is uh, rather grandly called the Sonnenschein Mantel De Bruyne theorem, do look it up if you wish, uh, De Bruyne has argued that uh, the idea that competitive forces will cause prices to tend to their market clearing levels cannot be demonstrated even in the best of all possible abstract models. 
It's not possible to demonstrate that a change in some variable, such as the wage, affects a corresponding quantity in a definite direction. In other words, it's not possible to prove you lower the wage and you hire more workers. It is not possible to demonstrate that. So there is no coherent economic model. And so what we rely on is some very simplistic models, which may or may not work. And the main one that's been used at the moment is the idea that if you lower interests, lo interest rates low enough, then eventually investment will take off. Well, interest rates are now basically down towards zero, and business investment in the UK is falling. Uh, it is not rising. The whole QE program, which has lowered interest rates, has resulted in asset prices being pumped up, whether they're houses, or the stock exchange, or whether they are, and this is a crucial one, uh, emerging market bonds, um, but has not really resulted in any significant increase in investment. There was a boost to consumption, which led to the UK growing in 2013, 14. Um, but that was mostly due to consumers increasing their indebtedness, not to increases in investment by the business sector. And so, the, and, but what has been the policy reaction to this? What is the reaction to the failure of interest, low interest rates to stimulate the economy? We must have negative interest rates. So we take a policy that's obviously failed, and what do we do? We have more of it. So here we have the dilemma. We have an economic structure in which jurisdictions have given away their power to manipulate the economy. Not totally, of course. I'm exaggerating. I'm putting it as a very black and white story. But uh, that is an essential component. Then when you pull the lever, you don't know what's going to happen. And if you pull a lever that is not liked by the international markets, uh, you will be penalized for it with adverse consequences rather than positive ones. The, the role of evidence has become very limited, so limited that a, a policy that's failing at the moment, people are simply saying we want more of it. And economists have failed to produce a coherent macroeconomics, which could be the basis on which policy was constructed. I think I'll stop there so that you can ask me, what do we do about it, rather than me go on uh, for too long. I want to leave some space for questions. So those, I think, are the three reasons why economics, poli economic policy is failing and is producing some very nasty, very unpleasant political consequences. Thank you. Thank you both very much for what was a fantastic and very interesting discussion on British politics, economics, and the future, or how to predict it. Now we open up to questions for the next 10, 15 minutes, and this is yeah, a great opportunity to ask questions either on their history and kind of as how laws and different positions, as well as on economics and politics and that interaction. So, yeah, are there any questions? Um, I was wondering about economics and politics. Is it um, often you see in the political sphere very big divides? So, shall I speak from here? Is this all right? Yeah, no, that was no, speak from here. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, yeah there's good acoustic in this room. Um, that's a, a, a very, very interesting question because economics, for those of you who study it, will know it's a rather funny subject because the, very, the great strength of economics is deductive analysis. You take a set of assumptions, you build a model, you derive your conclusions. The problem with deductive analysis as opposed to inductive analysis is you don't take any account of institutions and history, yeah. which is exactly what Richard was talking about. And the best economists are people who can use the deductive stories to tease out some of the logical structures which may exist in the economy, but also locate that in history and institutions. So the real political framework, if you like, dynamic of what's going on in the country at a given time. 
Now, unfortunately, I think, over the last 30 years, the deductive structures, often cast in terms of rather high-powered mathematics, have tended to dominate the economics profession. And the history, both the economic history and uh, the in contemporary institutional analysis, we can call it political science, I suppose, contemporary history, um, has declined quite dramatically um, as part of the profession. Uh, so there are major divisions within e economics. Obviously, people have very strong different, different views. But they tend to argue within this deductive framework rather than really connecting to the history and the institution and politics that Richard was talking about. I mean, th that is also reflected in the Treasury, where, interestingly, a number of the top Treasury officials uh, started in academic economics, or would have wished they did. I mean, Terry Burns, for yeah. instance, uh, was an academic who moved into government, uh, and who, over time, began to see his role, with, in a sense that, that um, John Eakville has been describing, of the institutions as well as the, 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 the deductive theory. Mm. Terry is very good. Mm. Um, and, and the same is true of his predecessor, Peter Middleton. But I can remember in the Treasury, I don't know why this comes to my mind, the, in 1990, in July, when inflation was roaring, um, the tra in those days the Treasury put up interest rates. We put up interest rates very, rap very steeply in order to have an effect, and the public paid no attention to it at all. And we had a fascinating meeting in which we all sat there discussing what was going on in the economy, that it was ignoring this lever. And um, we came to the conclusion that it was because, and it was, this was collective corporate treasury memory, um, that it was because everyone was on holiday and they had decided to go away in August and react to the interest rates when they came back from holiday. That's a trivial example, but it's an example of the way in which corporate memory of how these things really work tempered the academic theory. I don't know if that's relevant, but it's, 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 it's an example. But that, I think, is... There was a, fit, a period in the 90s, Terry Burns gave a lecture called The Death of Macroeconomics, in which, and, and A.E. George, I remember, did the same, governor of the Bank of England. They thought, you know, pride comes before a fall, that we had cracked the problems of macro macroeconomics. Yes. I think. Everything was solved. Everything was solved. Yes. And we've learned that's not so. One gets the feeling that there's a lot of money looking for a place to invest in. And it seems like right now a lot of people want to be in government bonds. Has that opened up some policy space, do you think, for governments that wish to be more fiscally expensive? Or you could. Yeah. Um, yes, I think it has. I mean, you see, the thing about how quantitative easing works, which is actually the source of an enormous amount of liquidity is the Bank of England creates money. It does it by... Uh, printing. It, well, printing, it does it on a computer. <laughs> and that's it. It declares that it's money. And it uses this to buy um, predominantly government bonds which are held by the private sector. So the private sector now has cash. Right? The question is what to do with it. And the uh, hope and belief was that it would be invested in new productive capacity. That has not happened. Why not? Because people are pessimistic about the future. I mean, it doesn't matter how cheap money is. If you invest your money and nobody comes along and buys your stuff, you lose money. It doesn't matter if the interest rates turn you um, So that's how quantitative easing was uh, expected to work and has not. However, there's an alternative which is that the Bank of England could print money in the same way, or do it on the computer, and they could buy government bonds from issued by the Treasury, or the debt office, actually it's called. And then the government would have the cash. And the government could spend that cash on new roads, railways, actually ensuring that we have decent broadband uh, throughout the country, on scientific research, on higher education on all, if you like, the supply side 
of uh, productivity and of productive capacity and of competitiveness, which is currently languishing. Um, so it does provide, and, and the money is with interest rates where they are now, uh, the government can borrow money at negative interest rates, basically, negative real. And so people pay you to take their money, essentially. And, and so in those circumstances, uh, the government could expand the investment, which it was hoping companies would do, but they haven't done, and could take the lead. So yes, it does provide space. You, you've actually put your finger exactly on the correct issue. But there needs to be an actor who uses that financial resource to invest in real capacity. So you've got the answer to the problem. Is that the answer? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's part of the answer. And the problem is, if the UK did that now, we are so uncompetitive internationally, our balance of payments would deteriorate. So, what, so there'd be a what, so there'd be a big problem. And there, so that's that's the problem that we yeah. have. That, that because Confidence. because yeah. investment has been so low, our competitiveness has deteriorated quite significantly, and we are running now a balance of payments deficit around about five percent of GDP, which is enormous. In other words, we're borrowing from foreigners to maintain our standard of living on a massive scale. And at the moment, the foreigners are happy to lend. But if they all look at each other and suddenly say, I didn't know you'd lend that much. By God, I didn't know you'd lend that much. Perhaps we should pull it out. Okay. Then we would be in some difficulty. So we've got a real chicken and egg problem. We've got to increase productive capacity and competitiveness in the UK. We can only do that by investing in the means of production, whether it's infrastructure, R&D, higher education, whatever it might be, right? all those broadband, all those components. But that itself will lead to a further deterioration of balance of payments. And so in those circumstances, what you've got to do, and you've got to be tough about, is to say, we are going to increase the share of investment in this economy and not the share of consumption. So you can't, at the same time, say, well, we're going to spend more on the health service. And that's tough. It's where the politics comes it's in. It's where the way. politics comes in, yeah. But you're quite right. I, I am chairman of a small bank, and we are considered very safe because we're very conservative. We, it's, a, it's an unusual bank eight partners carrying unlimited liability for it. So it's, 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 uh, it's got different disciplines from most banks. The most extraordinary thing is the way our deposits just keep on growing. We don't reward them, we pay virtually nothing for them. But people, every week we have a balance sheet. I've been looking at it today. We've just tipped another billion. It is extraordinary the way that just people are putting money in and in real terms they're losing. That it is effectively real mm. negative interest rates. Mm. And yet it's been going on for years. I keep waiting for it to stop. Sorry, I just, yeah. it, it, it's a very strange world we're in. But we are tra trapped by a kind of um, political conundrum that we can't reduce the NHS spending or whatever right. in political terms, but we can't free up the money for investment and infrastructure. But there is one way out of this conundrum, but it's the most difficult way of all, which is that if everybody did roughly the same thing at the same time, in other words, if the US started growing faster yeah. and the European Union started growing faster, then that would ameliorate the, any deterioration in the external position of the UK. But trying to organize that over the last 20 or 30 years has proved pretty fruitless. And that's a political problem. Yeah. Any questions then? There's do somebody you, over here. Yeah. Do you think uh, sort of not having financial uh, capital controls is is a good price to pay for sort of increased foreign direct investment or stuff like that? It's a bit late now. Yeah, way. I think that the point is putting the genie back into the bottle mm -hmm. is not something that's relevant. I think what you have to do now is to identify where the relevant lever-pulling possibilities are. 
Now, the UK has a traded sector of about 20 to 25 percent of GDP. So that means that we are heavily exposed to international markets and international finance. The European Union as a whole has an external traded sector of about 4 percent of GDP. It is the most closed economy in the world. The United States is about 5 to 8 percent of GDP. And so those economies are less dramatically exposed. And so those big continental economies have the possibility of pursuing more autonomous policies than little UK can. And so the, the problem is to identify, in the circumstances we have today, the relevant unit where policy should be performed. And the extraordinary thing in the European Union is that this is um, uh, under the banner of subsidiarity is a standard European Union uh, slogan. You must have policy at the relevant level. Right? The problem is they never thought what the relevant level for economic policy should be, which is at the, s the scale of the European Union as a whole. Um, yeah. Um, I actually have two questions like that. So, the immediate question that came to me when I heard your talks, which were both quite pessimistic, was, is there any hope? <laughs> but you've partly addressed that, I think, uh, already. But maybe you can, well, maybe you've, you have additional um, um, areas where you can find hope for it or not. I don't know. Another question is, and there's a frequent complaint that we're being run by technocrats, and that's maybe also prompted this question for this debate. So whether it's in Brussels, or in the Treasury, or in the, in the Central Bank, or, um, so how do you look at that? Um, is, um, the, is there hope? The answer is, of course, there's hope. I mean, if, we, if you think about the 70 years of peace and prosperity we've had, the position we were in in 1946, 70 years ago, was a great deal worse than where we are now. We were totally broke. Um, and we actually did slowly find a way out of that mess. It's just that the, uh, the, the problem now is so completely different. And we, I think we are very vulnerable as a country, which you, you very graphically indicated. And I think, it's, I think the Brexit thing could be the pin that bursts the bubble that we're in, because I think, we would be, I think people would lose confidence in us. And then, I, I mean, I'd leave it to you to explain what would happen, but it would be very dramatic. But the hope is that we remain in Europe, that, that Europe deals with the migration problem, I think, by the end of, uh, of, of some sort of botched up peace settlement in Syria, and people being able to go back home. And then Europe and America and Japan and China, for goodness sake, will have to do some sort of we you know we did manage to do it in a way up in yeah. Bretton Woods mm -hmm. after the war, um, and we were going to have to have some sort of international conference. The question is, how bad does it have to get before governments begin to realise that the only solutions are going to come if they act together, if the big power blocks get, get together? Because there are other worries, like the emerging. You refer to the um, debt of emerging economies, which mm -hmm. again yeah. are another dimension to this, which we haven't talked about, mm -hmm. but actually mm -hmm. another hugely parallel. We are in a perilous position and it's going to require, the question is how far will it, what will it take before the big governments, the big blocks begin to realise that they need to work together because that is actually the only solution. That's, that's not my analysis. I can't remember what your second question was. Oh, it is technocrats. What, what's wrong with technocrats? I mean, you, you need them, but you also need uh, big political leaders who've got the strength politically in order to do to, to take the um, economic measures that are required. Uh, and at the moment, a lot turns on who is the next president of the United States. Uh, and, and technocrats are on their own, are not much use to anyone. Uh, they need strong leadership who can do what has to be done. And that's a political force. And that, what worries me about the splintering of the political parties and the strengthening of the extremes, both left and right, is that they don't seem likely at the moment to produce the kind of people who will be able to provide the leadership you need, uh, which allows the technocrats to sit in the back room and work out how to deal with these problems. But that's, 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 that, that's where I am.
Yeah, I think that uh, I agree with Richard. We're at a difficult time, and the world is now more unstable and uncertain than really at any time I can remember. Even the oil crisis of the 1970s didn't produce the uncertainty of this. It wasn't like this. We had, there was a degree of confidence about what needed to be done, recycling surpluses from the oil producers and so on. Um, so we, have, we are in a very difficult situation. I think that, uh, in a way, uh, I think that universities have a real heavy responsibility. It is the responsibility of universities to really apply themselves to the problems and use the resource and the space and the time that we have which politicians don't have time. They don't have time to think. They, they always react to it. The time that we have to identify what the real issues are in the political economy of the modern world and to address them. Now, that's a very vague statement, but it is a statement about technocrats, if you like. Um, but the, there is one thing that is true about politicians, democratic politicians. And that is that democratic politicians want to get elected. And to get elected, they've got to do things which are deemed to be successful. And so they are keen to have policies which will be successful. And so in that sense, the vacuums that I talked about, levers which you've got, you pull them, there's nothing on the other end, um, the decline of evidence base to policy, and the incoherence of macroeconomics, all of those can come back to universities. And universities addressing themselves in economics, in politics, in history, and so on, as to what can be done. And providing policy ideas to the politicians, because they need them. And one can then hope that within the structure of the democratic parties of the centre-left or centre-right, there will emerge the sort of leadership which will challenge, which will be able to deal with these particular problems. And that is the hope. I admit it looks pretty uh, thin at the moment, but that, I think, is what needs to be done, and that's our responsibility. But it is, I mean, I have to tell you, temper that, if I may, by saying the experience of bringing in academic economists is not always encouraging. <laughs> if you think of Harold Wilson, coming in with the white hot technological revolution, but faced with the constraints of the balance of payments which dominated under the old regime, yeah. dominated his government. The people he brought in, who were Tommy Ballard and Nicholas Caldor, who in, the things they invented were things like the selective employment tax, which made absolutely, and the National Economic Plan, if ever you want an hour's amusement, read the, I've got a copy of the, the plan, which went down to how many flattened bricks should be made by the British. You know, it was the most extraordinary document. These were failed experiments which didn't, didn't work. Uh, and the people who have been influential, like Keynes, um, Keynes had to be right. I mean, the great thing about Keynes is he, he was the right man for the time. But we don't, uh, Milton Friedman arguably had a big impact on Margaret mm -hmm. Thatcher. And she did do things for the British economy with Geoffrey Howe and Nigel Lawson. Uh, and the MTFS and all the medium term financial strategy and all that, which actually lived up to the time. So you have not, you need to have economists who are right. <laughs> <laughs> fantastic, wonderful. Just a few years on the last run. But thank you both very much for, for what's been a fantastic talk and a very wonderful way to end the term as well. So thank you. Well, thank you. Very much.